can go with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. We'll start in verse 53. But as you turn there, as part of my study and preparation to preach through Mark, and also simply for fun, I've been learning about the Roman Empire. Something I did not know, but it's helpful for our understanding of the book, is just how intertwined their religion and their everyday lives were. I think often in America, we kind of feel like religion's a separate thing, and then we go about our daily lives, but that was not the case in Rome. No, in Rome, they believed their military won or lost battles based on the sacrifices that were offered in the temple. All their festivals, all their holidays, all their events were held in honor of a pagan god or another. In fact, they believed that to be Roman was to worship the pagan gods, the Roman gods. To reject the Roman gods was not just to reject their theology, but was to reject the Roman Empire, their culture, their people, everything. And so Christians were outsiders, not just religiously, but in every single way. They were on the outside of society. And so when a fire broke out in Rome in AD 64, AD 64, uh, about one to five years before Mark wrote his gospel, uh, the Christians were an excellent scapegoat. The people blamed Nero because they thought he burned a whole bunch of the city to make room for a new palace, which probably is true. Uh, We don't know for sure, but we do know for sure that Nero blamed the Christians because they were an easy target. Tacitus, a Roman historian, wrote of that time, he said, to stop the rumor that he had set Rome on fire, Emperor Nero falsely charged with guilt and punished with most fearful tortures the persons commonly called Christians, who were generally hated for their enormities, in other words, for their differences. Those who confessed they were Christians were arrested, not so much on the charge of burning the city, but on the charge of hating the human race. Simply because they confessed Christ and did not worship the pagan gods, the Roman people saw Christians as hating the human race. That's a pretty big charge. And those who confessed Christ faced all kinds of suffering, being eaten by wild animals in the Colosseum, burned as torches for Nero's dinner parties, all kinds of suffering. Many believers in Mark's day, in our own day, have given in to fear. We fear being accused of being un-American, being left out of our culture, so we deny Christ and participate in sin. We fear being accused of being bigots or on the wrong side of history, so we deny certain teachings of the Bible so we can fit in and avoid persecution. And certainly many Christians throughout history have feared physical suffering like imprisonment or torture like those in Mark's audience faced. Peter, for whose, uh, from whose memories this gospel is based on, he understood that fear. And as we saw last week, Mark himself knew that fear. He fled from Christ in the garden, and he fled from Christ on the mission field years later. Mark, in this passage, wants us to know that we're all going to face that fear. The question is, will we be faithful in that fear or not? We'll see in Mark 14, 53 through 72, a powerful comparison between Mark and Jesus. It's another one of his sandwiches that he has throughout his gospel. We see Peter preparing to face his trial in 53 and 54, Jesus facing his trial in 55 to 65, and then Peter failing in 66 and 72. This comparison is seen, and so we'll do our best to work these themes together as we study the Scriptures. So let's pray. Let's ask God to comfort our fears as we look to His atonement. Father, we thank You that You are a God of comfort, You are the God of all comfort. There is no true comfort apart from you. And God, we are are fearful of many things. Even the bravest among us who would say we are not fearful, we're fearful. We're just fearful to admit our fear. So God, I pray, work in our hearts. Humble us. Help us see that Peter and Mark were afraid. Help us see those first century Christians and their fear. But God, most importantly, help us see that Christ was faithful in the midst of fear. And because of that, we have hope to be atoned for. Let's pray that you, God, we pray that you would always be with us. You would always comfort us as you've promised to do. Open our hearts to the truth of your word this morning. Help us in our fear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In verse 53, we see Jesus being faithful. We'll start there today. Uh, but we, we see G- Mark gives us three reasons why we tend to deny Christ, why we fall into fear. The first is that we tend to fear power. We fear power. 
Jesus did not fear power. We're thankful for that. Look at verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest. <clears throat> and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Now remember, in our context, Jesus has just been arrested. He's been led before this council. Uh, all of his disciples have fled from him. And we see Jesus standing faithfully before the powerful. Mark tells us Jesus was led to the high priest. If you were here for our study of Leviticus, you know how important the high priest is. He leads the worship of the nation. And most importantly, his most important job is once a year, he enters into the Holy of Holies and makes atonement for the people. But in Jesus' day, the position of high priest had become mostly a position valued for political power. In Jesus' day, that priesthood was controlled by a man named Annas, who between himself and five of his sons and a son-in-law, he controlled either directly or indirectly the high priesthood for over 50 years, including the life of Christ. John MacArthur refers to this family as a first century of mafia family because they used the priesthood to gain wealth for themselves. The market that Jesus overturned the tables in was called the Market of Annas, the Bazaar of Annas, even though it was in the temple because people knew what it existed for. It was to line that family's pockets. And Caiaphas was his son-in-law. This was the high priest who was in office during Jesus' trial. So Jesus stood before Caiaphas, the current high priest, Annas, who controlled the high priesthood for 50-some-odd years. We must not forget where Jesus stood when he stood before them. It was not a public square or a courtroom where a fair jury may be found. They met in Annas's palace that he had built for himself in Jerusalem. This is a model of what it may have looked like when most people lived with their children, themselves, their parents, their great-grandparents, like 30 or 40 people on one little house. This was Caiaphas's home. This was Annas's home. And Jesus was not only brought before the high priest, he was brought before the chief priests, so the other leading priests, the elders of the nation and the scribes. These men formed the Sanhedrin, the most powerful people in Israel, apart from the Roman governor, who had certainly more authority. But in all aspects, apart from their interactions with Rome, these men were the rulers of every aspect of their lives. And just for a moment, we need to, this may sound strange, but forget Jesus is fully God. We know he is, right? So I'm not denying that, but just ignore that for a moment. And think about his humanity, because we have to think about Jesus as both, because he is both. He is fully human also. He was a tradesman born in a small village of less than 100 people, or lived in a small village of less than 100 people. He was born in a stable, didn't really spend time in places much nicer than a stable for most of his life. And here he is in this palace, standing before the greatest men of his generation, or at least the most powerful. It would be as if one of us were suddenly taken in the middle of the night into the residence of the White House to stand before the president and the pope and the richest men in the world. It would be very off-putting. I don't do well in front of people I know, much less crazy, powerful people I've never met. This is the picture Mark paints for us of Jesus' situation. We have to see the power he stands before to see the contrast of Peter, because while Jesus is faithful before the powerful, Peter falls before the powerless. Look at verse 54. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself with the fire. And then skip down to verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warm himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. Peter, as all the disciples had, fled from Jesus into the night. But Peter did not stay away. Mark tells us that Peter followed at a distance. He wouldn't identify with Jesus. He wouldn't stand with Jesus, but he'd follow far enough away to protect himself, stay out of trouble. And as Peter waited... He was recognized, but who recognized him? Was it one of the guards who saw Jesus in the garden, saw him cut off that servant's ear? Was it one of the high, high priests who had seen him in the temple with Jesus? No, it was none of these powerful people. He is seen by a servant girl. And does a servant girl at least go get the guards? Someone with some authority? No, she just, she didn't even accuse him of anything. She says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter, in his fear, denies even that simple claim. And he not only denies it, he uses two different words for no. He says, I neither know nor understand. He claims he doesn't understand the words she's saying. I don't know what you mean. He has no knowledge of this Jesus she speaks of. And then he says he has no understanding of what she says. He doesn't know Jesus personally. He has no connection. He has no intellectual knowledge. He has no personal knowledge. He has nothing to do with this man. And I'm not trying to be unkind to this girl. It's not that servants are unimportant. God does not value us based on the roles we have in society. 
But the contrast Mark is drawing is very important to understand this passage. Jesus stands before the most powerful and is faithful. Peter stands before this powerless servant girl who has no authority and fails. And friends, this is why we need a Savior to atone for our fears, because just like Peter, we often give in to the fear of power. Whether we fear offending or upsetting, let's say, our parents, even if they're unbelievers, we fear disappointing them. Or if they are believers, we fear confronting them. We often choose what to discuss or how our house looks or what activities we participate in because we're afraid of what our parents will say. But it's not just our parents. Some of us fear our bosses. So we'll do all we can to please them, even if it means missing out on time with our families or even if it means violating our conscience. We are afraid we'll lose our job. Or some of us who are in school, maybe our kids, we are afraid of our teachers. So kids, have you ever been afraid to say something at school because you're afraid you'll get in trouble for it, even though you know it's right and good and true to say? Why am I talking about all these fears? Well, because like Peter, we often face the fear of power, but just like Peter, the people we face are ultimately powerless, just like the servant girl. Parents, teachers, bosses, and governments, they only have the power God has given them. In his eyes, they are simply servants. They have no real power. We need a Savior to atone for our fear, one who never gave in to the fear of power. Because Christ stood before the powerful Sanhedrin, we can trust him as we stand before powerless servants. So this holiday season, when our parents choose to do something sinful, we can trust Christ and lovingly and respectfully confront them. Not because we're not afraid of how that might damage the relationship, but because we trust Christ in that fear. When our boss asks us to put our job above our family, we can trust Christ and lovingly, respectfully say no. Not because we're not afraid we'll lose our jobs, but because we trust Christ in that fear. When our teachers ask us to do or say something we know is wrong, we can trust Christ and respond like Him graciously, lovingly, patiently, refusing to submit. Not because we are not afraid of our teachers, but because we trust Christ in our fear. Friends, the goal is not to have no fear. The goal is to trust Christ in our fear. For some of us, simply standing before power is enough to lead us to deny Christ. But for others, our fear is more tangible. We need specific, measurable consequences for us to feel afraid. And so in the next set of verses, we see that Jesus atones for our denials that come out of a fear of persecution fear of persecution. Look at verse 55. This passage is so helpful. Mark knows the motive of these men. Some of them became believers and would have told Mark about these things. It says, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. I love that last part. They found none. Friends, Jesus was persecuted that night. We often are afraid of persecution. Jesus endured persecution we can't even fathom. The first kind of persecution he faced was unjust oppression. This council was not seeking justice. They were not seeking truth. They were not seeking to glorify the God who commanded them to seek justice. And as we saw in Amos, rulers are called to seek these things. It says the whole council together was seeking testimony against Jesus for the purpose of putting him to death. There was no hope of this being a fair trial. This is not really, it's a sham of a trial. From the beginning, their motive was to find him guilty and therefore, by abusing the political power, to murder him. But based on some historical study and a few clues that Mark and the other apostles give us, we know that this whole court case was unjust, not just because of their motive, but because of all the different things. I mean, pretty much everything about this court case is illegal. James Brooks and John MacArthur point out in their commentaries the myriad of ways this trial was unjust, and for the sake of time, I'll only mention 10, which when I say only 10, understand there are many, many more. So here's just 10 of the ways this trial was illegal. First, no trial could be held at night because all things had to be done in public and in order. Secondly, if the Sanhedrin decided on a death sentence, they had to fast and wait a whole day before they carried it out. Third, because of that required waiting period, And that fasting period, it was illegal to have a trial that may result in a death sentence the day before a feast, because then you couldn't eat the feast. So the fact that it happened on this day was illegal. Fourth, witnesses had to be warned to be true, and their testimony was only admissible if it was firsthand. We don't see any of that 
Fifth, a charge of blasphemy, which is what they end up charging Jesus with, was only applicable if the accused directly reviled God's name, which Jesus does not do. Six, the punishment for blasphemy was specifically spelled out in the Torah as stoning. The fact that Jesus was crucified rather than stoned means the Sanhedrin, if nothing else, violated the law on that point. Seventh, the Sanhedrin were forbidden from initiating charges. They could not charge someone with something. It's like the Supreme Court. They don't bring charges against someone. They only litigate charges others have brought. Eighth, the law required the Sanhedrin to meet in their official hall inside the temple if their decision was to be binding, yet we see them meeting in Caiaphas' house in secret. Ninth, when they bring Jesus before Pilate to have him killed, they don't use the same charge of blasphemy. They just make up a new charge when they get to Pilate's house because they're not really concerned about justice at all. And tenth and finally, perhaps most powerfully, bearing false witness is breaking one of the Ten Commandments. And yet the Sanhedrin not only don't do anything about all the people bearing false witness, they are actively encouraging it. Why do I mention this extensive list? Well, it's because we all know what it's like to have our rights trampled on and to face injustice. When HR gives us a warning, when we haven't violated our contract, or our parents change the rules on us without warning, or our teachers grade our papers unfairly because of some national standard, or even when our government demands we do something which violates the Constitution, friends, we can find comfort in the blessed truth that Jesus knows exactly what it's like to have his rights trampled. He knows what's that, that, what that's like. We can find comfort in him. He knows what it's like to be treated unfairly. He stands ready to comfort us in the midst of that persecution. Because we do not have a high priest like Caiaphas who used his position for power and his own glory. We have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has been tempted and suffered in all ways like we have yet did so without sin. So while it would be foolish to give practical advice from the pulpit for each of your individual situations, hey, when you face this unjust thing, here's what you should do. I'm not going to do that. That would be foolishness because I don't know all of our situations. And that would take us a really long time and it still wouldn't be great wisdom because it's coming from me. I can say that in every single situation in which we are oppressed, An ultimate truth that is always true is we can rejoice that Jesus stands ready to comfort us in that moment. He knows, he understands, he cared, and he died and rose to save us from oppression. There's coming a day when we will no longer be oppressed. Not when this or that party wins the election, but when Christ comes back. And friends, at least as a starting point, Jesus offers a wonderful example of what is often the wisest and most godly response to oppression. Because when Jesus faced injustice... How did he respond? Look at verse 61. He remained silent and made no answer. I want to be clear. I'm not saying there's never a time to speak up, to seek help or voice concern, but I do think our default step, our starting point as believers, should not be to respond like our culture, grab a megaphone and complain about everything that's happening in the world. That's what our world does. We should be separate from them. I think our starting point needs to be silent trust in God's sovereignty, even over our oppression. But this unjust oppression is not all the persecution Jesus endured. We also see him suffering under unrestrained violence. Look at verse 65. Some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. We see the unrestrained violence begin with spitting on him in their culture. I mean, in our culture, it'd be gross and rude, but in their culture, it was a specific thing. That was, if you wanted to dehumanize someone, if you wanted to show them they are completely unworthy of honor, you spit on them. But this was not enough for the wicked leaders. They also covered his face and struck him. So they put a bag over Jesus' eyes, so they blindfold him, and then they strike him, punch him in the gut, and knock out one of his teeth. And then they call for Jesus to prophesy and tell them which one of them had done it. And I find this so powerful. Uh, By striking Jesus and being so violent with him, they were fulfilling a prophecy Jesus had already made. In Mark 10.33, Jesus had said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit upon him and flog him, and kill him. After three days, he'll rise. And I look forward to getting to that part of the text. But until then, it's important to note, even as they mocked Jesus and told him, hey, prophesy, they were already fulfilling prophecy he had made. 
And when the Sanhedrin had poured out their violence upon Jesus, he was delivered over to the guards, those whose very job is to defend the weak and to protect and to care. And these weren't just like police like we have today. These were the temple guards. They spent all day in the temple of God, helping people to worship, protecting those who, that's their job, protecting those who came to worship. That's what they're called to do. And so what do we see these guards doing? Do they come and help Jesus and treat his wounds and protect him from this wickedness? No, we see them receive him as though he's a bag of potatoes and they receive him with blows. Friends, once again, I'm sure we recognize this kind of unrestrained violence in our day. How many believers must meet in secret out of fear for their government? How many of God's children have been mocked by their employers, supervisors, teachers, or government for their beliefs? How many of those bearing the image of God have been unjustly arrested, beaten, tased, shot, suffocated, and killed by the very officers that have sworn to protect them? Jesus knows what it's like to be unable to breathe. He knows what it's like to be unjustly beaten and arrested, to be betrayed and received with blows by officers sworn to protect the peace. By God's grace, I don't believe many of us have experienced that kind of violence. Most likely none of us will. So why make such a big deal out of this point? Because God has called us to offer help and hope in times of suffering. And even if we don't face that kind of unrestrained violence, we can give help to those who do. So the next time an unarmed man is killed by the police or a reporter is assassinated by a foreign government or a peaceful protest is put down by a government's military, whether here or around the world, rather than commenting on social media saying this policy needs a change or assigning blame before we know the facts, we can instead point people to Jesus who again responded to unrestrained violence with silence. because he trusted that God was working out salvation for even some of those who were putting him to death. Friends, if we speak, let us speak about the suffering and atonement of our Savior. Let us be continually pointing to the truth and everlasting hope for those who are victims of unrestrained violence. For they and all of us can find salvation in the blood of the cross. Jesus was persecuted by unjust oppression and unrestrained violence. And we see in verses 55 to 61 that this was not all. He was also persecuted by an unruly crowd. Verse 55 again says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. They found none, for many false witnesses, or many bore false witness against him. But their testimony did not agree. Councils looking for a reason to put him to death. That's their goal. And Mark tells us many stood up and gave testimony. But despite the wicked attempts, and we see these false accusations, their testimony did not agree. And for some reason, though they cared nothing about the rest of the law of God, they needed two or three witnesses to condemn Jesus. They can't get two to agree, they can't condemn him. And so the Sanhedrin move on from false accusations and they attempt forged accusations. Look at verses 57 through 59. Some stood up, surely at the prompting of the Sanhedrin, and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. Imagine how frustrated Caiaphas was. He's like, I told you guys what to say. I can't even get it right. Now, Jesus never said this. John records that he said something similar. He said, if you destroy my body, I'll rebuild it in three days. And surely that's what they're trying to quote here, but they can't even do that right. So with the sham of a trial in serious danger of being unable to produce a conviction, we see Caiaphas take things in his own hands. In verse 60, he attempts to trap Jesus with a forced accusation. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? He wants him to accuse himself. He wants him to say something that'll damn him. But Jesus remained silent and made no answer. No matter what accusations are hurled against him, Jesus remains silent. In the age of Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, I think we all understand the persecution and suffering that can come from an unruly crowd just deciding someone's evil or wrong and launching out at them. 
We've seen people we respect come under fire by an angry crowd, hurling false, forged, forced accusations, all based on misunderstandings, or often on an evil agenda. We've seen that happen to people we, re- we admire, we respect. Perhaps we've experienced it ourselves at work. Someone misunderstands something we've done, so they start a vicious rumor against us. Or, or at school, when someone begins spreading accusations about us, or sadly, some of us may have even experienced this in the church, when someone doesn't believe the best about us and accuses us of something. But once again, I believe we can learn from Jesus' response. Because it's so tempting in this world to defend ourselves. I went through that this week. I had someone text me and accuse me of something. And I started typing or something. I was like, no, that's not right. I don't need to defend myself. And I couldn't think about anything else for like an hour. And then I went ahead and defended myself. And then I went back and worked on this part of my sermon. And I was really frustrated with my own sin. It's so hard not to defend ourselves. Because we don't trust Christ. Jesus knew in his silence, in the midst of false, forged, and forced accusations, a better testimony to his trust in God was to remain silent than to defend himself. And that is almost always true of us. But Jesus is not the only one facing persecution during the sham of a trial. We also see Peter facing persecution. But there's a big difference. Jesus faced persecution because he was committed to fulfilling the Scriptures and to saving our souls. Peter faced persecution because he was unwilling to commit either to Jesus or himself. He wouldn't commit either way. Look at verse 54. Peter, again, uh, 54, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself with the fire and then looked down to 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, She looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway. And the rooster crowed. Jesus said it would crow twice to give Peter a warning. It crows. The servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, He denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly, you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. I mean, just remember, Peter said he was committed, right? He said he'd never leave him. He said he'd die before he denied him. And last week, we saw that Peter and all the others ran and fled from Jesus. He was not committed enough to stay with Jesus. But he was not committed to himself enough to go and hide. He wanted to follow Jesus, but at a distance. He was half and half. He was a double-minded man. We see him enter the courtyard, but he doesn't try and get close to Jesus. Instead, he sits and warms himself by the fire. He sits with the very guards who had just arrested Jesus, the very guards who were about to receive Jesus with blows. That's who Peter is sitting with. Peter's unwillingness to commit one way or the other is exactly what leads to his suffering to his persecution. The servant girl only recognizes him because he's warming himself at the fire. His face is lit up. If he'd been in a dark corner, at least hiding better, he would have been safe. She only finds him a second time because instead of leaving, he's standing in the gateway, both inside and outside of the house. Again, uncommitted. Despite hearing the rooster crow once, he doesn't get the warning. He keeps on his uncommitted path. And the third time, the bystanders join him because they know he's a Galilean. Well, how do they know that? The other Gospels say it's because they recognize his accent, which means Peter, instead of listening to the trial of Jesus, is making small talk with the guards. While Jesus faced suffering and persecution because he was fully committed to the Scriptures being fulfilled and to saving our souls, Peter suffered persecution because he was unwilling to commit to Jesus fully. And friends, I I think sadly, often the persecution we face is not actually because of our faith. It's because we're only partially committed. We're partially committed to Jesus, so we give and support the church and missions, but we're also partially committed to ourselves, so we complain about losing that money. We spend time thinking about what we could do with it if we didn't have to give it up. We're partially committed to Jesus, so we speak the truth at work, but we're only partially committed, so when people do it to us, we're angry. We're partially committed to Jesus, so we feel like outsiders at church or at work, but we're also partially committed to ourselves, so we feel like outsiders at church. We don't feel like we fit in anywhere because like Peter, we're in the gateway, we're half in and we're half out. 
Friends, if we want a blessed life, even in the midst of persecution, we have to be fully committed to Jesus. We must not fear persecution or we will spend our lives double-minded, suffering in every situation, both in good and bad, because we are trying to do both. What then must we do? How can we live in a godly, loving, gracious response to this fear of power? How can we endure persecution in a way that brings honor to Christ? We follow His example and we proclaim the truth. We often fear proclamation. We often fear it. Jesus, thankfully, He stood and proclaimed the truth. We see this in verses 61 and 62. Jesus remained silent. He made no answer. Again, the high priest asked Him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Friends, Jesus stood and proclaimed His identity. He proclaimed that He was Savior. Caiaphas understood he's getting nowhere, and so he just directly asked Jesus the central question of the book of Mark. Who are you? Specifically, he says, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And though Jesus has so far remained silent and made no answer, when people oppressed him, he did not open his mouth. When people were violent against him, he did not complain. When people made wicked accusations against him, he held his peace. But now, when the priest asks him the all-important question about the identity of Jesus, it is then that Jesus speaks. Throughout Mark, we have seen Jesus silence demons who proclaimed him. People he healed, he says, don't tell anyone. Be quiet about it. Why? Because it was not yet his hour. But his hour has come. And so Jesus proclaims who he is. Knowing exactly what would happen if he opened his mouth. Jesus wasn't tricked. He wasn't trapped. To the question, are you the Christ? He replies, I am. Jesus claimed to be Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. He claimed to be the promised seed of Adam and of Abraham who would crush the serpent and bless the nations. He claimed to be the prophet of Moses who would fulfill the law. He claimed to be the promised king of David who would reign forever. He claimed to be the promised hope that all the prophets spoke of who would deliver Israel. But Jesus is not merely claiming to be an anointed man like David. It wasn't against the law to claim to be Messiah. Otherwise, how would they know who the Messiah was? So Jesus goes further, and he claims himself as Son of God. For in answering, I am, Jesus proclaimed himself divine. Caiaphas asked him, are you the Son of the Blessed? This was a common way the Jews referred to God. They wouldn't say his name. Like in our culture, they wouldn't say God. If you're on a Jewish website, it'll say G-D because they don't want to even type God. They're they're so afraid of, of profaning the name of God, which is a good thing. We don't want to profane the name of God. So Caiaphas is asking, are you the son of God? But he won't say God. He says, are you the son of the blessed? And Jesus does not respond with, yes, I am the son of the blessed, or yes, what you've said is true. He doesn't avoid the name of God. He claims the name of God for himself because he says, I am the Greek version of Yahweh. God's name in Exodus, He's revealed as a self-existent, sovereign one, the I Am. Not the one who who will be, who was, who started. He's the one who always is in every moment, I Am. And Jesus claims that title for Himself. He doesn't have to refer to God as the Blessed One because He is God Himself. He is Yahweh made flesh. This use of the divine name, Jesus claiming to be the divine Son of God, that would have been plenty for Caiaphas to get a blasphemy conviction. Jesus could have stopped right there. He could have just said, I am, the end. But Jesus wants to make sure there's no question about what he's claiming. And so he goes further. He says, I am the Christ. I am the Yahweh made flesh. And then he proclaims another title for himself. He says, you will see the Son of Man. Jesus proclaims himself the Son of Man. This comes from Daniel 7, which Clint read for us this morning. There Daniel recorded a vision that he saw. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and presented himself before him, 
And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel saw a vision of this mysterious figure, the Son of Man. Now what do we learn about the Son of Man? What is Jesus proclaiming about himself? Well, that he's worthy to ride on the clouds like Yahweh. That he will be presented and found worthy before the Ancient of Days. That he will be given an everlasting kingdom without borders. And most powerfully, just remembering the context, Jesus is about to be beaten and spit upon and mocked. Jesus says that all peoples, nations, languages, even the Sanhedrin will serve him. For there was coming a day when they will see him coming with the clouds of heaven and he will have all authority and power and he will rule and reign on the earth and his kingdom shall never be destroyed because unlike the power of the Sanhedrin which came from wickedness and oppression, Jesus' power comes from heaven. And if that was not enough, which again, it was, Jesus goes one step further. He proclaims himself as the seated priest. He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Jesus is here referencing Psalm 110.1, which he earlier taught on publicly in the temple. There, David wrote, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. When Jesus claims that he will one day be seated at the right hand of power, the right hand of God, he is claiming that all of Psalm 110 applies to him. Well, what else does Psalm 110 say? Well, as we heard this morning, he's greater than David or any other king because David calls him Lord. He is greater than Aaron or any priest, even Caiaphas, because he is of the order of Melchizedek, not of Aaron. He is greater than anyone who has ever lived, for he is God and all will fall before him in judgment. Well, how did Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin respond to some carpenter from Nazareth proclaiming these things of himself, saying he's the promised Savior, divine Son of God, ruling Son of Man, an everlasting seated high priest? Look at verses 63 and 64. We see their response. The high priest tore his garments and said, what further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Friends, Jesus was not condemned because he claimed to be a good moral teacher. He was not condemned because he spoke truth to power. He was condemned because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be co-equal with the God of the covenant. He claimed to have the right to sit next to God in power and authority. He claimed to be holy enough to serve forever as God's high priest. He claimed to be worthy of all blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And he was right to claim these things. Though Jesus had been born humbly in a stable, he'd grown up in a small town, he owned no land, he had no wealth, and all his disciples fell away. This did not shake his confidence that what he proclaimed about himself was true. And no oppression, no violence, no persecution was able to distract Jesus from what was of first importance. He didn't argue about any of these things. He spoke only about the gospel. He proclaimed the identity and divinity of himself as Christ, Son of God and man, seated priest and King of kings. Friends, as I said, I think often wisdom would call us to face struggles in this life and remain silent as we trust the Lord. But there are times to take a stand and there are times to proclaim truth. There are times when we must not remain silent. Jesus shows us what those times are. It's those times when the identity of Jesus and his message are at stake. Let the world oppress us and take away our rights if they want to. That's never of primary importance for the believer. Let us not be known as someone who stands up for our rights, but rather let us be known as someone who proclaims the gospel of Christ. Let the world commit acts of violence against us. It's not the Christian way to respond with force. Let us not be known as militant people who will fight back, but instead as those who are willing to endure violence for the sake of proclaiming Christ. Let us, friends, let the world persecute us. Say all manner of wicked things about us, because they're going to whether we want them to or not. May we never be known as the people who are defensive or fear the crowd. Let us instead be known as those who will endure all manner of slander for the sake of proclaiming Christ. This is the example Jesus set for us in the Gospels. This is the example the uh, apostles set for us in the book of Acts. This is the example of the faithful believers throughout all of church history. 
It's the calling of Christ in our lives today to proclaim Christ regardless of the cost and to always make proclaiming the the Christ the most important, most central thing about us. It is of first importance. Through all oppression, violence, persecution, Jesus responds only when he gets an opportunity to preach the gospel of the kingdom. May that be said of us as well. And as wonderful and as glorious as Jesus' example of faithfulness is for us in this chapter, I kind of wish Mark would just end it there. That would make me feel a lot better. But Mark does not end it there. He has the other side of that sandwich. We see the ultimate failure of Peter. He so greatly feared proclaiming Christ. He so greatly feared being identified with Jesus that we see that he fell and profaned the truth. Look at verses 70 through 72. And the Bible says, but again, Peter denied it. After a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them. You are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. It's not just the servant girl anymore. A group of bystanders has gathered. Certainly, they say, Peter is found out. He has no hope to escape. So how does Peter respond? Does he stand boldly, proclaim the truth of the gospel? Does he say, look, I know Jesus is on trial, but this is exactly what he predicted. I remember him saying that. Does he open up the prophets, show them that they all said this, this would happen? Does he tell them about all the evidence he has seen firsthand that Jesus is Yahweh made flesh? No, he does none of that. While Jesus stood silent before false accusations, Peter swears falsely. While Jesus praised God, proclaimed his own deity, Peter invokes divine curses on himself. He's saying, look, if I'm lying, may God strike me dead. While Jesus stood and faithfully proclaimed his identity, Peter refuses to even say Jesus' name. He calls him this man. He won't even say his name. And in classic Mark style, immediately, as the third denial came out of Peter's mouth, the rooster crowed a second time. In that moment, Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. Remember the specific and explicit warning. He remembered the call to pray and watch. He remembered fleeing from Jesus with sleep still in his eyes. Peter broke down and wept. Friends, this gospel, which Mark wrote from Peter's memory, this is the last time we hear from Peter. This is the last thing Peter does in the gospel. The first gospel published, the one Peter himself helped write, the final thing we hear from Peter is that he broke down and wept. Friends, this is why we need the gospel. Because although God is holy and powerful and perfectly true at all times, we, like Peter, are often false, fearful, and deny him. That's why we need Jesus. Because though Jesus was born and lived as a human, he did so without sin, so he could fulfill his role as Christ to be our Savior. And though Jesus died on the cross to atone for our sins, he did not remain dead. For he was and is God incarnate. The grave could not hold him. Death could not keep him. He was risen on the third day to bring life to all those who would believe. And though Jesus is now in heaven preparing a place for his church, there's coming a day when the Son of Man will come on the clouds with great power and glory to judge the living and the dead. Our only hope is to cry out for salvation from our seated high priest, for he alone is worthy to go before the Father and get us forgiveness. He alone can save us from our sin. He alone can purify us and present us spotless before the Father. This is the message of the gospel, the message Jesus was willing to die to proclaim. But friends, don't misunderstand me. We're not the Jesus of this story. We're the Peter of this story. We will fall. We will fail. We'll deny Jesus before those in power that we fear. Out of fear of persecution, we'll deny him. And we all know at some level we are fearful to proclaim him to a hostile world. How then do we respond to this gospel message? Must we respond like Peter is our only hope to break down and weep? No, by God's grace, if we remember the promised truth, we have hope. Back in verse 27, Jesus prophesied and said, you will all fall away. What did 
What did Jesus promise Peter immediately after that? Before Peter could even object, Jesus said, verse 28, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Friends, Peter denial had not made that promise null and void. Look ahead to Mark 16. In Mark 16, after Jesus has been crucified, buried, resurrected, just as he said, an angel announces to the women at the tomb, he says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Go and tell Peter. The one who boasted. The one who fled from him. The one who denied him and profaned the truth. Go and tell Peter that Jesus will go before you to Galilee. And just as Jesus told Peter, Peter will see him. Peter will see Christ. Just as he told him. Jesus is going before the faithless, before the fearful, before the cowardly Peter into Galilee, and there he will see him. Friends, Jesus was not surprised by Peter's failure. And more importantly, Peter's failure did not make Christ's promise invalid. If you are here and you've never confessed Christ as your Savior, He waits to meet you in heaven just as He has told you today in His Word if you will believe. If you will repent of your sins and believe in Christ, the Savior of sinners like Peter and me. And if we are here and we have confessed Jesus before, but lately our fear of those in power has shaken us, Our fear of persecution has led us to deny certain doctrines. Our fear of proclaiming Jesus has kept us from proclaiming the gospel. Friends, we must be broken over our sin. That is a right response. We must weep over our denials. That is a right response. But then we must rejoice. For though we have denied him, just as he said, Christ has gone before us in heaven, just as he said. And we will see him there just as he said. No matter how we have denied him, no matter how we have failed him, if we believe the promise of the gospel, he will, never, he will forgive us and receive us with joy. So let us pray. Ask God to draw us closer to Jesus through our faithful proclamation of the gospel this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for how you inspired Peter and Mark to include this section of the gospel that just seems so negative, seems so terrible. We wonder how could Peter do this, but God, I'm thankful for it because it reminds me that I I could do it. I, I do it every day. I know the truth and I still deny it. But God, just as you said to Peter, you have said to me, you said to each believer in this room, though we deny you, you will never deny us. When we are faithless, you remain faithful, for you cannot deny yourself. Jesus, even as you claim there in that court, you claim to be, I am the covenant-keeping God of the Old Testament. We know you will keep your covenant with us that we saw two weeks ago poured out in the blood and bread of the new covenant. Your blood and body. God, we we need, we need the hope of this promise. For we are prone to wonder and prone to leave the God we love. But praise him. He is never prone to leave us. God, I pray, let us trust in your faithfulness, not our own. Let us repent of our fear and our denials, trusting you that your atonement is perfect and complete. God, bless us this week. Give us faithfulness in the midst of power, in the midst of persecution. God, give us courage to proclaim your truth, not because we are not afraid, but because we trust you in our fear. And God, most importantly, most urgently, most desperately, we pray that you would come back on the clouds with power. You've promised that you will see us again. We long for that day. Come back and save us from this wicked world. 
But if you tarry, give us faithfulness as we wait. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.